algebra lesson for unit six, we're going to start talking about solving systems of equations in two variables. So how might we do that? There's a few different ways that we can do that. We can do it algebraically and we can do it graphically. But sometimes graphically isn't always the best way, especially if they don't meet in a crosshairs sort of way. So let's talk about what is a system of equations. It is composed of two or more equations considered simultaneously. For example, if we had x plus y is 6 and 3x minus y is 2. We even can get into three variables, and we'll talk about that during our next lesson. This is what's known as a system of two linear equations, since we have two equations, in two variables, since we have the variables x and y. The solution set of this particular system consists of all ordered pairs that make both equations true. When we graph a system of linear equations, each point at which the graph intersects is a solution of that system. It could intersect in one location, so we would have one solution. They could never intersect, which means they would be parallel lines and there would be no solution. Or they could be the exact same line on top of each other having infinite many solutions. Let's solve this system of equations graphically. We have x minus y is 5 and 2x plus y is 1. I'm going to write both of these in y equals mx plus b. So I'll start with x minus y is 5, subtract x from both sides, and divide by negative 1. I now have a graph which with I can use y equals mx plus b, so slope intercept form. I'll start at negative 5 and I'll go up one over one, rise over run. Now I'll move on to 2x plus y is one and solve for y equals mx plus b. Subtracting 2x from both sides, y equals negative 2x plus one. And now that I have it written in y equals mx plus b, I'll start at my y-intercept and use my slope to find the next points down to to the right one. I see that they have intersected at a specific point here and they intersect at the point two negative three. That means that two negative three is the solution of the system of equations. So a couple of things to consider. If a system of equations is consistent, it has to have at least one solution. If a system of equations has no solutions, we would call it a inconsistent system. We could also label them as dependent or independent. So an independent system has exactly one solution, where a system of equations with an infinite number of solutions is what we call a dependent system. Some of the graphs listed below when we have exactly one point, we would say that this is an independent system with exactly one solution. And since it has exactly one solution, that falls under the consistent because it has at least one solution. What if both of the graphs are on the same line? We would have infinitely many solutions. This would be called a dependent system and it would also be consistent because it has at least one solution. If our graphs are parallel, these are an inconsistent system since there are no solutions. One algebraic technique for solving system of the equations is what we call the substitution method. In this particular method, we use one equation to express one variable in terms of the other and then substitute that expression to continue solving. This is especially great since we know that when we graph, not all the time will our graphs fall on a nice crosshair of a whole number. So this will be helpful to utilize when we might have fractions or decimals as our solutions. What I'm going to do first is take my first graph, x plus y is five, and I'm gonna solve it in terms of x. So now x is equal to five plus y. I then can take my new equation and substitute that into our second equation so that I have two times five plus y 
plus y is 1. Notice now we're all in terms of y, and now I can solve for y. Distributing, I'll have 10 plus 2y plus y is 1, or I'll have 3y plus 10 is 1. Subtract 10 from both sides, I have 3y is negative 9, so y is equal to negative 3. Now that I know that what y is, I can substitute this y value back into either equation to obtain the x value. Let's just say we plug it back into the first equation. So x minus a negative 3 is 5. x plus 3 is 5. When I subtract 3 from both sides, x is equal to 2. So 2 negative 3 is the solution. This is a consistent independent solution. We also could use the elimination method. We're going to eliminate one of the variables. So when I'm looking at the equation 2x plus y is 2 and x minus y is 7, if I were to add these variables together, I see that my, my y values would immediately eliminate themselves, leaving me with just x. So I'll line them up and add them together. When I do, I'll have 2x plus x, which is 3x. My y's disappear is equal to 9. When I divide both sides by 3, I have x is equal to 3. Now we can substitute into one of the original equations. It doesn't matter which one so that we can obtain y. Let's just use the top one. 2x plus y is 2. My x value is 3, so 2 times 3 plus y is 2. Subtract 6 from both sides, so y is equal to negative 4. We can double check our work, but I see that 3, negative 4 is our solution. We have a consistent independent solution. Sometimes it might be necessary to multiply one or both equations by a specific value in order to find two equations in which the coefficients will end up able opposites of one another such that we can cancel them out when we add them together. Such as example 4. When I'm looking at 4x plus 3y is 11 and negative 5x plus 2y is negative 15, if I were to add them together, none of our variables would eliminate themselves. But what I could do is multiply my first equation by 5 and my second equation by 4, and they would both have 20x, one being positive and one being negative, so that when I add them together, the x values eliminate. When I multiply my first set by 5, I'll have 20x plus 15y is 55. When I multiply negative 4, I'll have negative 20x plus 8y is 60. When I add them together, my x values disappear. I have 23y is equal to 115. Dividing both sides by 23, I see that y is equal to 5. Now we can substitute into either equation, either original equation that we so choose. I'm just going to choose the top one. So 4x plus 3 times 5 is 11, 4x plus 15 is 11. Subtract 15 from both sides, we end up with negative 4. Divide by 4, we have negative 1. The pair is negative 1, 5. Notice that I use decimals to help us graph. I see they intersect at one point. That matches what we algebraically found. And this is a consistent, independent solution. Let's use the elimination method here. Here I have x minus 3y is 1 and negative 2x plus 6y is 5. Notice that our x values 1 is positive and 1 is negative. Same with our y values. I could easily multiply just the top value by a positive 2 so that they end up with opposite but the same value. When I multiply the numerator by, or the, excuse me, the numerator, the top equation by 2, I have 2x minus 6y equals 2. I don't need to change anything to my second equation since it already has the coefficient of the opposite of 2. When I add these together, notice what happens. 
our x's and our y's cancel, leaving us with 0 is equal to 7. This is a false statement. This tells me that my equations are parallel to one another, which we can verify utilizing decimals. So because they are, the solution set is, is not there, there is no solution, um, the equations are inconsistent and independent of one another. Let's look at a second example here. I have 2x plus 3y equals 6 and 4x plus 6y is 12. I noticed that the top and the bottom lines, if I were to multiply the top line by 2, I would have 4. However, I need 1 to be an opposite value, so I'm going to multiply my top line by negative 2 so that 1 is the opposite. When I multiply across, I'll have negative 4x minus 6y is negative 12. I don't need to change anything with my second line because it already has the opposite of 4. When I add them together, I end up with a true statement. This tells me that these are dependent of each other because they're the exact same line. And because they are the exact same line, they have infinitely many solutions. We can write these solutions in general form using x and y. However, I'm not going to require you to do that on our homework, so we can skip this part for now. Let's talk about an application of how we can use a system of linear equations in order to do so. At Max's Munchies, caramel corn is worth $2.50 per pound. It's mixed with honey and roast, honey roasted mixed nuts worth, of, worth $7.50 per pound. And our goal is to earn 20 pounds of mixture worth $4.50 per pound. So we need to intermingle these snacks to make that happen. Let's try to guess a little bit and see, um, see what we come up with. At Max's Munchies, caramel corn is worth $2.50 per pound. It's mixed with honey roasted nuts worth $7.50 per pound. We would like to get 20 pounds of mixture of the two that would be worth $4.50 per pound. How much of each snack is used? So let's guess and check. A possible solution might be if we mixed 16 pounds of caramel corn, we would then have four pounds left for nuts. So our total weight does equal the 20 that we're looking for if we had 16 pounds of caramel corn and four pounds of nuts. The cost then would be $2.50 times 16, which would be 40, and 750 times four is 30, we end up with 70. Well, a mixture at 450 per pound would be 450 times 20, so 90. Our guess is slightly lower, but it helps us translate what we're actually looking for. Let's, let's let x be the number of pounds of caramel corn and y be the number of pounds of nuts. And let's organize our information. We have caramel corn, nuts, and the mixture. We know that per pound, caramel corn is 250 and that per pound, nuts are 750. We don't know the number of pounds for each. So we'll label them X for calmer corn and Y for nuts, but we do know that we need a total of 20. That then translates into 250 per X plus 750 per Y has to be $90 or 450 times 20. We also have a second equation that's automatically listed here with x plus y is equal to 20. So now that we have two equations, we can solve. I'll have x plus y is 20, and 2.5x plus 7.5y is 90. Let's multiply our bottom equation by 10 so that we can eliminate the decimals. It gives us some nice whole numbers. Now we have x plus y is 20 and 25x plus 75y is 900. I can multiply my top row by negative 25, so I have the same but opposite as my x value in the, in, the, in the bottom row. 
When I share the negative 25, I have negative 25x minus 25y is negative 500. When I add these together, I'm eliminating my x value. I have 50y is equal to 400. Dividing by 50, I see that y has to be 8. Now we can substitute probably back into the top equation since it's a little easier than using decimals back into our original. So y plus 8 is 20 or x is 12. That tells me then that I need 12 pounds of caramel corn and 8 pounds of nuts. 12 and 8 we know is 20 so that part checks out. 250 times 12 pounds plus 750 times 8 pounds is $30 and $60 for a total of $90. So our mixture should be 12 pounds of caramel corn and 8 pounds of honey roasted nuts. Let's try another example. This time we're going to use um, distance, rate, and time. An airplane flies 3,000 miles from LA to New York with a tailwind in five hours. The return trip is against the wind and it takes a little longer of six hours Find the speed of the airplane in still air and the speed of the wind. So let's let P be the speed of the plane and W be the speed of the wind. So two things we are trying to find, so two variables is what we need. We know that the distance of each trip going there and back was 3,000 miles. But we had a speed with the tailwind took us five hours and the speed with a headwind took us six hours, so against and with, if that's helpful. We have a table that distance is equal to rate times time that we can fill in here. So with a tailwind, we still went a total distance of 3,000 miles. Our rate was PW, and our time at which it took us to get there was five. With the headwind, we still went 3,000 miles. Our rate was P, the speed, minus the tailwind, and that took us six hours. We now have two, we have two equations here. We have 3,000 is equal to um, P plus W times 5, and 3,000 is equal to P minus W times 6. Divide both sides by 5 here to simplify and divide by 6. Our two equations that we're working with are 600 is equal to P plus W and 500 is equal to P minus W. Right away, I able, I'm able to see that my W's are already opposites, so I can go ahead and add them together to eliminate a variable. This gives us 1100 is equal to 2P, since our W's cancel, divide by P, me divide by 2 and we have 5 1100 uh, 550 is P so P represents the speed of which the plane is going we now need to find the speed at with which our wind is so substituting back into one of the equations for P it doesn't matter which one I chose the first equation 600 is equal to 550 plus W when we subtract, I then see that the wind speed would have to be 50 miles per hour. Checking our work, we see that the speed with the tailwind equals our 600 miles per hour. Speed with the headwind is 500 miles per hour. And when we double check the time with which it takes, it checks out at five hours and at six hours. Therefore, the speed of the plane is 550 miles per hour and the speed of the wind is 50 miles per hour. Let's suppose that the price and supply of the star chain, star station satellite radio are related by the equation y is equal to 90 plus 30x. So this is going to be our supply in the next. This was our supply where y is the price in dollars at which the seller is willing to supply x thousand units. Also suppose that the price and the demand for the same model of satellite radio are related by the equation y equals 200 minus 25x. This is our demand. 
for y is the price in dollars at which the consumer is willing to buy x thousand units. We're looking for an equilibrium point, which gives us the equilibrium price. This is where the solution comes to happen, where supply and demand equal themselves out. We're not making too much and we're not selling them for too much. So we want to find where they're equal to each other. We have our two equations. Um, so let's, let's familiarize ourselves. So let's substitute some values in for these equations so we can get an idea of what, the, what they're actually looking at. So let's start when x is equal to 1. When I'm looking at my supply and I substitute 1 and I'll have 90 plus 30, which is 120. When I substitute 1 in for y, excuse me, um, we'll have 200 minus 25, which is 175. The value of our y supply in this instance was less than the value of our demand. So we haven't reached equilibrium because these two values would need to be equal. Let's try our x value of 4. Let's see if x equals 4. If we made 4,000 units, would supply and demand be happy? When I substitute 4 in, I'll have 90 plus 30 times 4, which is 210. And 200 minus 25 times 4 would be 100. In this case, our supply is greater than the demand. So we're still not equal to each other. So our x value must be in between 1 and 4 for that to happen. Let's try carrying it out and seeing what happens. I'm going to use the substitution method. Since they're both equal to y, I'm just going to substitute this y value into here. That will give us the 90 plus 30x is 200 minus 25x. I'll add 25 to both sides, 25x to both sides, so that uh, all my x's are together. So 90 plus 55x is 200. Subtract 90 from both sides, I have 110. And divide by 55, we have 2. We said up here that our x value had to be between 1 and 4, so 2 seems reasonable. When we substitute 2 for x and 150 for y in the two equations, we find that they do check out. So the solution is 2,000 um, items that we're going to sell. And the equilibrium price itself is 150. So if we sell two, we produce and sell 2,000 uh, units, the equilibrium price would be 150. And this concludes our lesson on solving systems of equations in two variables.